Okay, guys. Thanks for joining us tonight. Tonight we begin <laughs> the study of Sefer Vayikra, Baruch Shech, Yadu V'Kimanu, V'Giyan L'Zman Hazeh, Nu Chumash. And every time we learn it, we learn new things, Baruch Hashem. We're learning tonight for the Refuah Shema of Kol Chole Yisrael. All those that need a speedy recovery, Hashem should send it to them. Especially um, Shmuel Moshe Ben Pnina, Rabbi Baruch Ben Sivya, um, Shed Ben Roa Karamel Ben Heshmat, Rachel Bat Shoshana, any other names, guys, we want to mention? Okay, beautiful. Hashem, they should all have a refuah betoch shar chole Yisrael. Amen, very quickly. Amen. Okay. So, oh, welcome, welcome, Mokhim Abayim. Guys, help yourselves. Okay. Remember. There you are. How are you today? Okay. So... We're going to start off lighter, but then we're going to get uh, into some heavier uh, subjects tonight. Is that Hashem? Okay. So the Pasuk starts off, Sefer Vayikra, with the commandment, the idea that there are certain mitzvot that we have to do, we have to bring korbanot. Korbanot are, they, the, 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 term, the word korban means a sacrifice, but it comes from the word karov. Karov means to become close to Hashem. Through bringing a korban, a person is able to come closer to Akadosh Baruch Hu. That's ultimately the idea of the korbanot and the idea of the mishkan, to come close to Borei Olam. And we have a whole long list of different types of options of korbanot when a person wants to bring a thanksgiving offering, he wants to bring a shlamim, a peace offering, he wants to bring all kinds of different offerings. Uh, he has the right to donate korbanot to the Bet HaMikdash. That's what the Pasuk starts off talking about. As we get further in, we learn that there are different types of sacrifices. There are some sacrifices that come for a person who is wealthy. Um, if he's able to, he brings a very nice porban, a nice sheep, a nice goat, a nice uh, all kinds of different animals that are a little bit, you know, for somebody who could afford it. But then you have somebody that can't afford that kind of a korban. So he brings something like a bird. It says that he brings turtle doves or pigeons because that's what he can bring. And then there's a fellow that doesn't even have that. So he brings what we call a mincha, which is a flower offering, which is literally flour. It's not really that much as far as the physical thing that we that we normally would look for. So, you know, it's considered to be a lesser of a korban, but says the, says the pasuk, it says... The nefesh who makrib, he's offering his soul. When, when a person is that poor, that's all he has to offer. It's considered like he's offering literally his own soul because this is all he, can, all he can bring. So over here, Rashi points out a very important point. Rashi on Perak Aleph Pasuk Yudzayin starts off telling us the following. He says, Ne'emar be'of re'ach nichoach ve'ne'emar be'behema re'ach nichoach. It says, when it comes to a person who can only bring a bird as an offering, it's much smaller. So the Torah calls that a reach nichoach, an appeasing aroma to Hashem. It's a good fragrance to Hashem. Hashem likes it. And it also says, reach nichoach by behema, which means when you offer up a big animal, a goat, a sheep, a cow, that's also called an appeasing aroma to Hashem. It says Rashi, lecha, what is the reason for this? Whether a person brings a lot, or a person brings a little bit, the one condition that Hashem is looking for, that his heart should be focused on making Hashem happy. That's really what it's all about. So whether the person brings this huge animal, but if he's just trying to show off, that's not what Hashem wants. If a person brings a little bit because he's cheap, that's not what Hashem wants, right? It's whatever you're doing, you're bringing big, you're bringing small, the main point is that you should have the desire to come close to Hashem. You're doing this for Hashem. That's the key. The, the Mepharshim point out that many times people look at the previous generations and they say, you know, who are we next to the giants of the previous generation? And it's true. We're really, we, we don't even come close to them. The people that we're thinking about, Chafetz Chaim, you know who the Chafetz Chaim was? He was huge. And the Chafetz Chaim was thinking about this himself with the people before him and the generations that preceded him. 
and so on and so forth. As you go back, the further you go back, you say to yourself, you know, we are so far off from what it used to be like. We don't even do a quarter of what they used to do. Talking about people that knew the entire Shas by heart, they knew everything. It was like a, a generation of people that was really, really an, on a high level. And we're so far away from them. So over here, that's where this Rashi comes in. Whether a person does a lot or a person does a little, but the main thing is that what he's doing, he's trying to serve Hashem with it. A person comes to Shachrit in the morning and he says, this Shachrit is to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That is what counts. It has to be that what he's doing is the Shem Shamayim. He's trying to serve Hashem. He's got no other motives just to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That is something that will make the person very that, 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 that will make the person very beloved in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when he does it L'Shem Shamayim. Nowadays. What? Nowadays. Yes. They, they say over a story, I'm going to say, speak a lot about the Ari HaKadosh Nadineder. So they say over a story about the Ari, that one time his student of Chaim Vital asked him, how is it that we, how, how can we even look ourselves in the mirror? We look at, we look at the previous generations. And you see that, you know, we're so far off from them. We're so different than them. And, you know, we're, we're not even close to what they used to be. So they say that Barry answered him, said you should know that in our generation, he was talking in the 1500s. In our generation, he says, the Yetzirah is so strong, he says, that, that what somebody in this generation does, that's even a small little thing, but it's considered to be tremendously big things that were done in previous generations. Welcome. The Ariya Kadosh said, you think to yourself, well, you know, we, we're, no, we're nowhere near what they used to live like, how those tremendous Sadiqim used to be. Said the Ariya Kadosh to his student of Chaim Vital, you have no idea the small thing, quote unquote, small things that we do in this generation because the Yetzirah is so strong and there's such a temptation around every corner. So it's, it's worth much, much more in this generation than what it used to be worth previously. That was the area in the time of the 1500s. Can you imagine today? You, we don't even realize when a person puts on tefillin today, what that's worth. Really? The person in his, in his tiny pocket it says in Mitzrayim, we were in the 49 levels of Tum'ah, right? Today, in the average person's pocket is a little device that has much more than the 49 levels of Tum'ah, all there waiting for him at any given moment, whatever he desires. And this guy, instead of going for that, he says, I want to be with Hashem, and I want to put on tefillin and observe the mitzvot. It's a huge deal. We don't even understand how big of a deal that is in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch This is the Ariya Kadosh. Yari Kadosh said this in the 1500s to his student Abim Chaim Vital. Oh, he said it. He said it about his time. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what we what, what if, that, if he was saying that about how Yitzchak is so strong in his days? Well, what about today? How much more so? So, so it's unbelievable. Baruch Hashem. So when somebody does a mitzvah, he has no idea how precious precious it is in the eyes of a Kadosh Baruch. Okay, so. That's an important lesson that I want to share with you. Now, the Pasuk in the parasha talks about some very interesting halachot. And then I want to share with you the interpretation of the Zohar Kadosh on these halachot. Very interesting. Over here, the Torah talks about the following things. Again, this is in our parasha, so it's important to be aware of what's going on over here. It says like this. This is a discussion about a person that he knows information about a monetary dispute between people. So let's say we have Reuven and Shimon. Reuven says, Shimon owes me $100,000. Okay? I sold him money. I, so I sold him merchandise. He never paid me, right? Let's say that that is the situation. Now, Ruven takes Shimon to court. The court tells Ruven, listen, if you want to take money out of Shimon's pocket, you're obligated to prove 
that he owes you the money. The rule is hamotzi mechavero alavariyah. If you want to take money out of someone's pocket, the burden of proof is on you. You have the responsibility to, to, to say that he owes you the money. Okay. So Reuven says, no problem. I have a witness, right? And he comes to a witness. Let's call him Levi. He says, Levi, you were there when I gave the merchandise to so-and-so and he agreed to pay $100,000. Correct? Because yes. Okay. I want you to come testify that he took the merchandise because he's saying he never touched the merchandise. You were there. You saw with your own eyes that, that he took the merchandise and that he agreed to pay the money, $100,000. So I say to Levi, I say, uh, Levi says to uh, Reuven, he says, listen, I'm very sorry. I have no idea what you're talking about. Why is Levi saying that? Because Levi is a little buddy-buddy with uh, Shimon. He doesn't want to get on his bad side. So he denies it. And he says, I have nothing to do with your claim against Shimon. I don't know about it. I don't know about the merchandise. I don't know about the deal. And to be two witnesses. So there's another guy, there's Yehuda, and Yehuda is also buddies with him, and he's saying the same thing. You're right. So the two witnesses, good point, the two witnesses that could have helped Reuven get his $100,000 that Shimon legally owes him, they're both denying ever knowing anything about this transaction. They don't know nothing. That's what they're saying. So Reuven says, listen, I'm not playing games with you. This is a lot of money, and I need the money. So here's the deal. I am going to make you swear on a Sefer Torah. You're going to literally hold a Sefer Torah. And I'm going to make you swear to God Almighty that, if, that, that you don't know anything about this. And let's see what you do. And they, unfortunately, they take the Sefer Torah, they hold it, and they swear on a Sefer Torah that they don't know anything about what I'm talking about. Okay. That's the story. Now, what happens is their conscience is killing them. They caused the loss of $100,000 to this guy. They were there. They were witnesses. They know it. And they swore falsely on a Sefer Torah. I mean, it, it just gets worse and worse. They come forward and they say to the Beddin, dear Beddin, we're very sorry. We swore falsely on a Sefer Torah that we didn't know about what happened over there, and we knew. So they come clean. That's the case. Let's read it again. V'nefesh ki You have a soul, a person that did a, that did a chet, did a sin. V'shama'a kol ala, which means that he accepted a demand for an oath. Reuven demanded from Levi, you must take an oath on a Sefer Torah that you don't know anything. And he accepted it. But really, Ed, if he is a witness, he knows what's going on, right? He saw what happened. He, in other words, he was a witness to the transaction. He knows that it, what the guy is saying is a lie. He's saying, I never took the money, the, the merchandise. It's not true. You did. I saw. Or, Oyada, it says it could also be that he knew that it was, maybe he wasn't there at the transaction, but it's possible that he saw the buyer in front of two witnesses say, yeah, I took that merchandise from him and I, uh, and I owe him the money. So I saw him say that. So even though I might not have been at the transaction, but I saw with my own eyes that he said this in front of witnesses. So it means he's admitting that he owes the money, right? And then, if he doesn't, if he doesn't get up in court and say testimony to help Reuven, then he's going to have to bear the burden of his sin. Okay, so that's a very grave sin. This is called Shemuat Ha'edut. Shemuat Ha'edut means that you testify, meaning, I'm sorry, that you swear that you do not know any testimony to help this guy when you do. Yeah. Understand? Big sin. Yeah. So what, what, is the, what is the verdict on such a person? So it says, huh? Those two, they did do they get punishment for lines? So, so I'll read you exactly what their what their treatment is going to be now. 
So it says like this, there are another two cases that, that this, uh, this kind of korban applies to. So first of all, first thing he has to do, he has to confess what he did. He has to confess in front of Hashem that I did not testify to help my friend when he needed me, and I could have helped him to get money, and I didn't. I actually swore on a Sefer Torah that I don't know anything about his case. So he has to get up and say that in front of Hashem. Now, Vehevit Ashamul Hashem, he has to bring what's called an Asham. Right? Asham means he has to bring a guilt offering. Al Khatato Asher Khata, he has to for the sin that he did. Nekeva minatson kisba o sirat izim lechatat. He has to bring a sheep, a female sheep, or a female goat as a sin offering. Vehiper alava kohen me khatato. Okay. And then the Kohen will atone for him when he brings this chet. Now, if he can't afford the sheep or the goat, then he has to bring the pigeons or the turtle doves, the birds. Right? Okay, so, so that's step two. That's his korban that he has to bring. Okay, clear? Why he said female for... Why female? That's a good question. Why should it be a female bedafka? I'm not sure. For the bread, it didn't take anything. For the... I don't know. That's a good question. Why does that be a female? I don't know. Very good. Okay. So now, that's what he has to do. He has to bring a korban for what he did wrong. Clear? The case is clear? Yes. You have a question. Sasan, so, so, Only if it was asked. Was asked, asked to to yeah. Only if it was asked to confess. Yeah. And then, so what yeah, he, he, he was asked to testify. He vaulted. And then the the fellow said, "Look, I don't I don't know anything to help your case. I have nothing to do with your case. I don't know anything." He lied. Then the person who needs him as a witness to help him out, he then makes him swear on a sefer Torah that this guy does not know anything about so the case. If he didn't swear, he didn't have to bring correct. 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 Only correct. if he swore, yes. Correct. Correct. That's right. If he didn't swear, he wouldn't have to bring. Correct. That's right. Okay. So that's that's the halach. Now, I'll be honest with you, I would not know this Zohar Kadosh if I wouldn't have seen it in this very holy sefer called the Kav HaYashar. Okay? This book, the Kav HaYashar, is one of the most incredible books that goes into the depths of Kabbalah and makes it kind of palatable to us. Um, so he says something really, an amazing explanation from the Zohar on this Pasuk. I'll read it to you. I'll read parts of it to you inside because it's really unbelievable. He says like this, this is the Kav Yashar Perik Ayin Zayin. Says the Zorah Kadosh. The Pasuk that we're talking about, you have to ask yourself, why is it that the Torah uses certain words? It says, V'nefesh ki techeta. When a nefesh does a sin, nefesh means like a soul, right? So why is it talking about a soul? kol <laughs> Allah. And then it heard, so the translation here says, he accepted a demand for an oath. What does that mean? It means that the guy, Reuven, asked him to swear to God that he doesn't know anything about the case, and he did. Right? So he accepted the demand for the oath. Over here says the Zohar, says the Kaveh Ashar in the name of the Zohar, this is talking about a neshama, a soul, before it descends into this world. This pasuk over here on a deeper level, and the level of sod, as you know, there are four levels. There's pshat, remez, remez, drash, and sod, pardes, right? There's pshat, the simple level, remez, hints, drash, what you can expound from it, and sod, the secrets. Over here, says the Zohar Kadosh, this is the secret of this pasuk. It says, this is a, Pasuk that's talking about a soul before it descends into a body. And it goes through the most amazing thing. It says there's a whole procedure before the neshama comes down into this world. There's a very official procedure in Shemaim of what happens. Pay careful attention to this. It's really amazing. It says, Before the neshama comes down into the body. Molichim et ha-neshama be'elef u'shmona olamot. 
they take the neshama into 1,800 worlds. So that the neshama will see the honor, the glory and the honor, the respect of the Talmidei Chachamim that studied Torah in this world, that studied for the sake of heaven. They're shining like the sun in the sky. And on their heads are these beautiful covers of made of precious stones. They tell the neshama that's about to descend into the world. Look at the honor of the tzadikim. That sit in Gan Eden. If you will conduct yourself good like these tzadikim, you will also merit to this respect and honor that they're getting. Then they bring the neshama in front of God, in front of the Holy One, blessed be He. And they dress it up in this beautiful, in this beautiful, uh, so to say, clothing. They put it in the body, in the in the face of the body that it's going to be in. The neshama, the neshama, for that moment, it basks in the in the divine. Uh, pleasure of being close to Hashem. It goes through the whole entire thing that's going on over here. Now, look what happens. So what does this have to do with this pasuk over here? So it says like this, So they say like this, they say, um, they say to him like this, The fear of God has to be on your face. They, they make this neshama swear in the name of God while it's in Shemaim. That it's not going to sin. They warn it a few times. Then this neshama bows in front of Hashem. Then it goes into the body and descends into the world. Now, Tov, if the person is a tzaddik, then he's very good. So now, if a person is not doing the will of Hashem, now this is where this pasuk comes in. So then the Torah, in this pasuk, is wondering about this wicked person. And it says, If a nefesh sins, we have a big question. It says, V'shama'a kol Allah. It heard the kol Allah. It, it heard the, the, the voice that demanded it to not sin when it was in Shamaim. It heard a voice from Shamaim making it swear, right, that you can't sin. So how could it do that? V'kol ha-shevua shehayu mashbi'im ota ba-marom kodem shagal aguf adam. Didn't it hear the, the, the oath that they made the neshama take before it came down? They warned it a few times. So that's the question of this pasuk. Says the pasuk, So the pasuk tells him, look, you messed up. You did things that were wrong. It's not possible for a person to know how many things he's done wrong in his life. We've done so many things wrong, it's just not possible. We don't know. We're not even going to remember how many times we've messed up and how many times we've done things. We, there are things we don't even know that we did wrong. But there are some things that we do know. So, ora'a, maybe something that you remember seeing yourself doing wrong that you, you, can, that you, that you are aware you messed up in some way. Oyada. Or perhaps you just know in general you have certain issues that you have to deal with. Says the Pasuk, in that, in that case, Tuchal Lashuv Bichuva Shlema. So you can still fix what you've done wrong in your lifetime. You can still fix it. And how do you fix it? You have to do exactly what the Pasuk says. You have to go ahead, like it says over here, and confess what you did wrong. You have to do vidui. You have to stand up in front of Hashem at some point between you and yourself. It could be in shul, it could be at home, wherever it is you want to do this. 
and you stand in front of Hashem and confess in front of Hashem exactly what you know you've done wrong. That's what it says. Okay? So when you do that, so then, if you don't, it says the Pasuk, if you don't say, in other words, the guy who's supposed to give testimony, he doesn't give testimony over here. It means, it means if you don't say the vidui that you're supposed to say and come back to Hashem, that's when you're in trouble. You understand the point, guys? Yeah, one more thing. It says in the Pasuk, the guy was supposed to give testimony for his friend, right? So Im lo yagid if he doesn't say the testimony, then he's going to bear the sin of having lied. I have a question. Right? One second, let me just finish the answer. So over here he says, so the answer to that is that if you don't do the vidui, meaning if you don't confess to Hashem, you don't say what you're supposed to say. In this case, it's testifying for your friend. But in this, what the Zohar is explaining, it means if you don't say to Hashem, I made a mistake with this, with this, with that, and I'm trying to change myself and be better, then the Pasuk says, then you have to bear the, the burden of the sin that you messed up with. So we do vidui for the Nefesh Abayimit. So we're doing vidui for, for to be able to come back to Hashem. That's that's the purpose. The guy on the friend has to do a testimony for a friend. Right. And this one, the Nefesh Elohim, that will do something for Nefesh Abayimit. The point is to elevate, to elevate yourself, that you shouldn't be yeah, Nefesh Bahamit anymore. Any sin? What? Of course. If you do it, it has to be for any sin. Sure. That's yeah, the yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any sin? Anything. That's what it says. Ora Yada. Whether you, you saw this happening yeah, yeah. with yourself or you know you happen to have this problem, a person does the vidui, and then when he does the vidui, he accepts upon himself to get better and to work on himself. So that's the process that will help the person to become a bad teshuvah. Would he ever know that he, he was accepted by Hashem? He can rest assured that if he did his best, it will be accepted. That's always the rule. Hey, yeah. hey, Rabbi, the yes. guy, the, this guy, made his friend lose so much money. Yes. Now they make him redo, they bring two for him and finish? Is it Correct. Like that? You see, the problem is like this. That's a good question. You're asking a nice question. Huh? No, no, that's a great question. You know why? It's a very good question. Yeah, okay. no, no, it's I'm just saying nothing. It's not $100,000, so, whatever. So, the person who... Right. Right. Good question. They, 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 right, so, so that is a wonderful sugya in Masechet Baba Kama that deals with exactly your question. And the answer is that whenever I am gorem a nezik to you, which means I don't directly harm you, meaning I don't directly take your money away, I don't directly cause damage to you, I simply cause something that causes damage to you. So the halacha says in that case, I'm exempt. I don't have to pay you. But it is chayav bedinei shamayim, which means that after 120, if I did not pay you back, then Hashem will be upset at me. So that's the halacha of grama. Grama means that I indirectly caused a damage to you, but I did not do it directly. Understand? But that's the that's a big difference. But that's directly. So, no, this is not directly. I didn't steal money from you. Directly. I didn't steal money from you. The guy who took merchandise from you and never paid you, he stole money from you, right? So he owes you the money, right? That's that's the guy that really owes you the money. The point is over here, I did it indirectly. Whenever a person causes damage indirectly, the court cannot force him to pay. So he doesn't have to pay. But it says he's chayav bedinei shamayim, which means that after 120, when he goes up to shamayim, that will be something he has to pay. Now, is this called grama? I'm not sure. This is just refraining from giving testimony. I don't even know if this is called grama. Okay, yes. Why he pay after 120 years? Why he doesn't pay yet? <laughs> that, that's the smart thing to do. You're right. If you're, if you have a, if you have a, I can, I can, I can, I can, right. yeah. If you have a, a, a little bit of a brand and you want Olam <laughs> Haba, so then you take care of it in this world, so you don't have to so take care of it in the world to come. Uh, Correct. Then you're gonna have a Correct. You're right. Hundred percent. That's the point. You have to take care of it here, even though the court can't force you. But if you have a little brain, you you do that. Yes. <laughs> Yes, Uriel knows about it. Amazing. That's great. That's right. That's Pater Medine Adam. Excellent. Okay, good. So says the Ariya Kadosh, a very interesting, a very interesting story about this. 
that the Kaveh Hashem brings down. Again, if you guys ever want to just sit and be like sucked into a book, get yourself a Kaveh Hashem. They have it in English, by the way. You won't be able to put it down. I kid you not. I'll tell you, don't have to tell me. They have it in English. So, yeah. I have a question on this. Okay. So, the Neshama that went through all of that, and he comes in a body, in a, for example, a family that is not so much about they don't keep for him. Right. He's always sinning. Right. Right, as opposed to he's coming to be the son of the rabbi. Right. So he's sinning too, but less chance of sinning. You already put it so again, like you said before, in the other family. Like we said before, every person is judged based on his circumstances, based on his situation. And oh. it's not the same thing for everybody. Like the Ariya Kadosh, we started off with this beautiful point that Chaim Vital said, we're nowhere near what they used to be like, right? And this is Rav Chaim Vital, the one who wrote every single thing that he ever taught him. Oh. All the Kabbalah we have is from him. So somebody I mean, and he said, we're nowhere near. And he said, listen, what you're doing now in previous generations would be considered huge, even though we're nowhere near the previous generations, but we have a different fight to fight. <laughs> And how much more so for our generation? So everyone is with is is is, is judged based on the circumstances that he's put into. And you're right. What are you supposed to do? So sometimes we're put into a fight that we don't have any control over. It's, it's we're losing from the moment we're born. It's a That's problem. Why you suffer here? What? Ruben suffered here. Yes. Okay. And the other guy after 120 years go up the the given uh, punishment. But Ruben, he lost money. Yes. He suffered here. Yes, but there was a root, there was a reason for that. So Ruben had, had to, to for some and reason, he, he had to suffer. From the yeah, they had to suffer. He, he went through something for a reason. There's a reason for it. The Ariya Kadosh over here, the Kaveh Hashem brings down a story about a woman who one day came to the Bet Midrash and she was, uh, she, she was asking for help because she was feeling very strange, very weird. And she didn't know what the situation was and she needed help. And the Ariya Kadosh told her that there's a neshama that attached itself to her, what they would call a dibuk, which means like a, a, a soul that attached itself to her. So the Ari told her that she has to go back to her home and she has to wait for his student, Rav Chaim Vital, to go in to deal with the situation. So he told Rav Chaim Vital, listen, you have to understand to get rid of a dibuk is not a simple thing. You have to, you're, you're going to have to ask it its name, first of all, and then What's it's going to lie to you. What? What's the book? The book is, a, is a neshama that is clinging to a, a body of, a, of another human being. Neshama from somebody, somebody else. Yes, a a body. yes. Some, someone that had you're passed away that. and now is clinging to the neshama of this person. So he said, this is going to be a neshama that's going to lie to you. You're going to ask its name. It's lying. And then you're going to ask it again. It's another lie. And that's again. It's going to be another lie. It's a lying neshama. So you have to ask it a few times. Eventually, you'll get the name. And then you're going to have to do this and that. And he told him all kinds of names of Hashem to be able to get rid of this neshama. So it was Ben Hashemashot. It was uh, after Mincha. He goes when it's twilight towards this house of the lady. And they, were, they had told him after he came that when he was on the way, the neshama was, was saying out loud in front of everyone, coming out of the voice of this woman, that Rav Chaim Vital is coming to get rid of me. He's coming to get rid of me, but I'm not scared of him. I'm not afraid of him. It's a whole big thing that he was saying, and, and he was threatening the people that were in the room. Eventually, Rav Chaim Vital came. He asked, what's your name? And it was a lie. He said, what's your name? Tell me your real name. It was a lie again. No, he says, tell me your real name. And it was another lie. The fourth time, he said the truth, what his actual name was, this uh, neshama that was inside of this woman. And he was telling him that he wants him to leave to exit this woman from the pinky of her toe. And the Neshama said, no, I'm going to exit from her throat. And Rav Chaim Vital was very scared that he's going to try and damage the woman's uh, cords, her vocal cords, her, 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 much more than that, her trachea, her esophagus could pierce it, God forbid, and, and kill her. So he said, no, no, I'm not letting you do that. And he left the neshama there. He went back to do arvit by the arvit. He told him what happened. And he says, you, you did something very wrong. You went at nighttime. At nighttime, they have more power than we do. Until chatzot. That's why, by the way, we never say slifot before chatzot. Because at, at nighttime, until chatzot, they have, no the, they have much more power. The negative forces have more power than 
the, than the Rachamim. So therefore, we, we don't do anything. So he waited till the next day, and then he came back. And then again, he said, I'm making you swear that you're going to come out of the pinky of this uh, lady. And it did. And people said they saw like a little, almost like a little fiery something coming out of her pinky. But before he let that neshama go, he asked, who is this neshama? And he said, uh, he told him his name and he said, why, are you, why were you not let into Shemaim? So he said, because I spoke a lot of Lashon Ara. I spoke a lot of gossip. And I was a very big liar. I lied a lot in my lifetime. So what he spoke a lot of Lashon Ara. So, so what happened, so he said, so how did you, how did you uh, get in? So he said, one time, so he said, I was not given permission to go to Shemaim. I was not given permission to go into any person. But I was given permission when one day this lady, she came to do the, um, to do, to prepare for Shabbat for cooking. And while she was cooking for Shabbat, she was singing a song that had foul language in it, Nivul Pe. It had foul language in the song she was singing. The minute she sang that song, I was allowed to go into her. And that's when he got into her. And he was there for three years. Wow. Living off of this. So what happens to our own neshama? See, what happens is the reason that this happens is because that neshama is getting is getting pulverized by malachim chabala by angels suffering a lot. But if it's inside of a body of another person, it gets protected. So he wants to stick around as long as he can. But eventually, Rav Chaim Vital got rid of it, and that's the end of that uh, that scenario. But the point is, Rav here's a person. What was he doing already? Lashon Ara is very harmful. It's very devastating. But, you know, it's it's just using his words. You know, it's just bad words. It's speaking not nice things about people. And look what happened to the guy. It's scary, right? And this woman, she just sang a song that wasn't, you know, it wasn't appropriate. So <laughs> that gave permission for the for the for this terrible neshama to enter its body. It's scary, Abotai. It's scary. It's not something to be taken lightly. So this, these are things... But it's the Chazal warned us, about the Chazal said, the Rambam paskins this halach lemaise, that a Baal Lashon Hara does not have a chilek le'olam haba. The Baal Lash, a person that habitually speaks Lashon Hara about people, does not have a share in the world to come. It's mefurash. It's not like we don't know about this. It's clear in the halach. So we choose to ignore it. That's not good. That's devastating. It's very important to be on top of our game on this. So it's important to be aware of these things. Now, oh, I'm sorry. Did yes. You went into her because she said Lashon Hara too? No, because oh, she sang true. a song that had foul language in it. Like Michael Jackson. Nivul Pe. Nivul Pe. Nivul Pe and foul language. I heard that I couldn't go up there only people to kill themselves. So I didn't hear that somebody had. No, no, no. We're going to get into it now even more. Okay, I'm not done. I'm not done. Hold on. Yes. What? It says she was singing songs with nivulpe. Nivulpe means a foul mouth. Curse. Probably it means curses, but it means maybe inappropriate things. It, the point is, it wasn't holy kadosh songs. It was she was singing some bad stuff. Anyway, Can you imagine? I wonder what. In the 1500s, man. Who knows? Wow. <laughs> Can you believe that? Yeah. Anyway, so that's that's what happened. Again, this, these are it's important for us to be aware of these things. Now, we transition into Bezal Hashem tomorrow night is Rosh Chodesh Nisan. Okay, that means Erev Pesach. Again, the Kavli Ashar over here, he's he brings down some really important points about where we're headed, the month we're headed into. And I'll just share with you a Gemara that he is about to quote. And this is one of those Gemaras that you learn and you say to yourself, what in the world is this talking about? But I'll read it to you inside and you'll, you'll see what's going on. Take a look at this. It says like this. The Gemara is talking about the idea that if you're praying Amida, you're not allowed to stop for anything. The only thing that you're allowed to stop for, if God forbid it's a danger to you, life-threatening, maybe uh, a goyish king that's going to feel threatened, slighted by you, you can you can stop for him, right? If it's a, if it's a, something that could, God forbid, kill you, that's uh, on your leg, it says you could stop for that. Yes, Uriel? 
Um, if you're a middle schooler essay and it was like a robber, are you, do you have to start from an essay? If it's God forbid life threatening, then yes. Yeah, you do. Correct. Okay, so it says like this. It says, Reish Torah Bedikula. Even if the head of a bull is buried in its feeding basket, slik leagra darga mitutach. Go up to the roof and remove the ladder from under you. Meaning, run away. Even if you're, you're near a bull and it's you know it's eating, run. Don't go up to the tree. Go up to the roof and remove the ladder. Says the Gemara. Shmuel said you should know that brayta doesn't always really mean that. So this is only regarding a black bull and in the days of Nisan. Because the Satan dances between the horns of the bull at that time. So this is a Gemara. This is Daflam. Gimel Amud Aleph, Masechet Berachon. Serious? I mean, I must have gone through that. Never in my life did I understand what in the world is this Gemara saying, right? You see certain things, and uh, so Rashi says over here, the Gemara says, you know, because in the time of Nisan, that's when the spring starts, so the grass, uh, the grass starts to grow, and his mood becomes expansive, and he is overcome by a destructive urge. The bull. Yeah. The what? The bull. The bull. The bull. The what? The bull. So the, the sugar, you know, yes, crazy yes, because the grass starts to grow. So, you know, you see this, and it's like, what in the world is going on? So over here comes along again, the Kaveh Ashar, with this really incredible explanation. So he says like this. Again, from the Ariya Kadosh. During the days of Nisan, the grass starts to grow and everything starts to blossom in the, on, the, on the ground. And the ox is able to eat from it. Now, who cares? What does that have to do with anything? Why should that make his... What, what does that mean then, right? What does it mean that the Satan is dancing between his horns? Very strange. And it's a black ox and it's only during Nisan. What does that have to do with anything? He says like this. He says, A lot of people nowadays, he says, they fail in different areas of life and sinning with different things. Some people, they speak a lot of Lashonara and they joke around with things they shouldn't joke around. Some people have bad thoughts. Some people sin with their bodies. Maybe they not kosher, maybe they do other things. Every day people are making more and more of these mistakes, more and more of these sins. And we do more sins than good. And what happens is, because of this, when people die, instead of their neshama being elevated to shamayim, they don't get let into Shamaim. They are mata. They come and they settle on the ground. Now, sgurim olam. They're trapped. They can't go anywhere. Now, when do they have a chance to get built back up that they should be able to go up to Shamaim? When the grass starts to grow, the neshamot of the reshaim attach themselves to the grass in order that they should be eaten by animals. If then a person eats that animal or that vegetable that grew from the ground with the neshama attached to it, so the person who eats that piece of meat or that eat, eats that salad with the neshama attached to it, when he eats it and he says a bracha on it, he's, he's metaken the entire neshama. 
Do you understand what's going on? So what happens to the neshama? It becomes a part of this person. Yes, it becomes a part of this person. And then he, through his mitzvot that he does, he expends that energy on that mitzvah that he's doing. And that helps the neshama to go up to shamayim. Okay? So now, one second. So now. So here's here's the point. So so the other neshamot and idachim yotzim ma'afila le'or gadol. Then they get they come to the great light. Ve'hine. So he says like this. Teva hashol. So he says the the ox shehu ochel deshaim harbe. The ox eats a lot of grass. So as mitkansin bekirvo elu haneshamot hadechuim. So all these neshamot that are attached to the grass, they all go inside of it. So he's got a bunch of who knows how many neshamot this ox. Has inside of him. Ubizman heyota mesugarim ba'arit nitosef b'shor azut ugvura shel asitra achra. He says because this ox is eating all of these neshamot and they were reshaim, that's why they weren't allowed into shemaim. So now the ox becomes very uh, brazen and he he's gets gets even more attached to the etzara to the sitra achra, and therefore this causes him to want to cause damage to everything around him. And especially, that's why the Gemara says a black ox. Because when it's black anyway, it's predisposed to want to cause damage. So now, that's why over here, that's why we have a minhag. We have a minhag. All the minhagim that we have are extremely holy. They come from very holy sources. I mean, how that we have is from Rosh Chodesh Nisan, from that time, we start to pray for the neshamot that passed away, that they should be elevated and should be allowed back into Shemayim. That's why we have the Minhag. We read the Nasi of the day. And through that, we hope that the neshamot that we are praying for should be elevated and should be allowed back into Shemayim. And he says, when should you have this in mind? Are you praying? This is the answer. We say, how do we start off after Baruch Hu? Baruch Hu the Shem Ruach, Baruch Hashem Rav Ha'ed. Baruch Hata Hashem, Elokei V'Kolam, Yotzer, Oro V'Choshem, Oseh Shonom Ruach Ha'kol. Right? Ha-me'ir la-aretz ve-la-darim aleha derachamim. Which normally, when we pray those words, we say, Hashem, you, sign, you, you shine the sun on all of us. Baruch Hashem, it's morning. Now we have sunlight. Thank you, Hashem. Ha-me'ir la'aretz. But now it has a new meaning. Ha-me'ir la'aretz Hashem. There are some people that literally, meaning some neshamot that literally live on the aretz. They live on the ground. Hashem, shine your, your light on them. Ha-me'ir la'aretz ve'ladarim aleha berachamim. Have rachamim on them. Take those neshamot, elevate them. Don't just let them stay here. Don't let them go into some girl. Don't let them just, you know, let them be elevated up to Shemaim. Take them in. How through a fruit that we say, Brahman? Do something, Hashem. Either take them straight up or let them go through a fruit and let them be eaten by a tzaddik that is going to say, Boreh Priya Etz on it, and then boom, you'll be able to go up. I know, but this. So he's saying during the month of Nisan, this is what you should have in mind. Yeah, yeah. So like this, all the those kind of shambo, they have to go to Eretz Israel because the only cow they eat over there, they do shabita and they take bracha. Why they can go to Uruguay? When they go to all our all our meat comes from Uruguay to Africa. What? In Ur- Uruguay is uh, Uruguay, Uruguay. 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 Is, a, is, a, is, a, is where they where they make the they slaughter the, the, okay, the cows they for kosher. They're not going to say bracha. No, we we a lot of our meat comes from South America. That's the meat that we eat. Comes from different. But my point is, wherever it is, Hashem, make it work for them. Make it work out for them. So that's what he says. Lachen tzayich adam liitpalel bechol chodesh nisan beomor hameir laaretz veladarim alei berachamim yeharher. When you say those words, sheyair alehem akadosh baruch hu berachamim lehalotam imaneshamot anidachim. So that's what you should have in mind, says the Kava Yashar, which is an amazing, amazing point. Now, why does it say in the Gemara, Satan Ben Karnotav? 
Why does it say that the Satan is dancing in between the horns of the black ox in the month of Nisan? So again, we understand the black ox is an ox generally predisposed to damage. Now, during the month of Nisan, it's like on steroids. Why? Because all those neshamot are inside of it going, driving it crazy. Now, why is it specifically the Satan says Shmuel is in between the horns of the black ox? So he explains, because every animal has something that is a feature unique to that animal that gives it strength or gives it some kind of, let's say a deer is very fast, right? Can run very quickly. Right? There you go. That's right. Let's say uh, a lion has, is very strong, right? Different things. Crocodile have, has huge teeth. Where is the strength of the ox? So that its horns are where it gores from. So says the Kabe Ashar, Ki ikar geut shel ashor hu bekarnav. The gava, the arrogance of the shor, is in its horns. So the yetzer hara, meaning the satan, can only rest on a spot of the body of the animal that has gava. That has arrogance. Says the Kaveh Ashar. It's, a, it's such a powerful lesson for us. He says, you have to know. He says, even if you have a person. It says, Kol ba'alei ha'gava. I have to read you these words inside. Any person that has arrogance. Hamid ga'im bishvil oshram. Whether they are arrogant because of their money, their wealth. O bishvil chokhmata. Maybe they're arrogant because they're very smart. They're brilliant. Or because they come from the most, uh, their, their, their uh, pedigree, their lineage is super duper special. He's the son and the grandson and great grandson of the tzaddikim. Or maybe he's just very, very knowledgeable and very learned. Whatever the reason that he has arrogance, whatever reason he's got it, why ever, it doesn't matter. Even if this person studies Torah, if they have the attribute of arrogance, listen to the words. You should know this person is a chariot for the Sitra Akhra. He is the car that the Satan rides in. Wow. You understand what he's saying? You could be Mr. You know learning all day from morning till night. If you have arrogance, you are the Merkava of the Sitra Akhra. Do you understand what he's saying? Okay. Okay. Here we are. Oh, that? Here we are. I, everybody in their own thing. You know, I know for a fact, you know, if I, you know, people, people need to know themselves. If you know that something is making you feel above everybody else, you should try and get rid of it. If you know something is causing you to feel like you're on a higher level than other people, because of whatever the reason may be, you have to try and get rid of it somehow. This is what we're learning. This is what we're learning. The ga'ava is the merkava for the sitra akha. The arrogance is the car that drives around the Sitra Akhra, and it's you. You're that vehicle. Not you, God forbid, none of you. I'm just saying. Would you that person. You what? Would you say that much? <laughs> 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 My, My point, point is, is it's, for, it's not, that's that's the problem. So I always say it's you. It's, it's me. That's that's the point. It's me. I'm, I'm the up. one that has to work on and myself. Yes. Get rid of the gava, get rid of the thing that you're, that's causing the, it. The point is get rid of the gava. But what is the thing? But if you know that there's, Wait, some, for example, let's say, smart, let's say, say I'll give you an example. No, let's say, no, let, no, let, no, I'll give you no, just an example. Smart here. Smart here. Oh, right. smart here. Look, let's say, man. right. Let's say, for example, I know if I buy a certain car, I'm going to feel uh -huh. like I am better than everybody else. Let's say I'm going to set, I'm going to, let's say, uh, I don't know, save right. up money don't, don't and I'm going to buy car X. That I probably, I don't know, you know, wouldn't even fit in. <laughs> you know, <laughs> these cars that, <laughs> you know, these cars, and you, you know what I'm saying? And you sit there and then I'm like, hey, where do I sit? It's not like, I'm and you have to pay $500,000 for that car. Anyway, so if, if I save up money and I buy that car, I can drive around great, like on Sundays, 
and show off my car, right? I'm going to feel like I'm the king of the world better than everybody else. So then you make sure you don't do that. Yeah, but That's if, Gava, if, 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 right? If, if that, if this and it's in different feel... areas. Or let's say I finish the shas. And I know that finishing shas is going to make, I have to prepare myself. Say, hey, when you learn it, you're learning it not because you want to show off. You, you have to think, it. I'm learning for Hashem, to know Hashem's Torah. What does Hashem want from me? Right? Not to learn because I want to show off and say, look at me, I finished shas. That's not the way to do it. Right? You have to know. You have to do it for the right reason, I will say. You understand what he's saying? He's saying the month of Nisan is so important because this is the month that you have to make sure that you are praying for these neshamot. You can't have a gavel get it before you wait. Well, you can't have a you wait. You mean you're very proud of her that she's yeah, a wonderful sure person? You can't have a good wife. You can be very proud of her. That's great. So that gavel. No, I mean, it's you're saying, look at me. I, I, yeah, I, 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 <laughs> so let's just finish off over here okay so he says like this so just understand where we're headed since the whole month of Nisan is days of Rachamim tremendous mercy where Hashem is willing to, to, to do things above what's usually done therefore <laughs> so the, the holy Neshamot in Shemaim they pray for us that's how they start off. And it says that they are also They always are suffering when, when we are suffering here. If they, in Shemaim, they see it, it says that they're suffering too. Then it's good to go to Kevin uh, Tadikim. It's very good, but not during the month of Nisan. During the month of Nisan, we don't go to Beta Kaprot at all. Okay, that's right. right. How come they pray for us? Because that happens beforehand. So it says, Ach, she'en le'en reshut legalot. Those neshamot don't have the right to reveal to us. Sometimes they come in a dream, but normally they don't have any permission to say anything. He says over a story about the father of the Rosh. Father of the Rosh, Rabbeinu Yechiel. Again, the Rosh, we all know who the Rosh is, right? Rabbeinu yeah. Asher. Rabbeinu Asher was the father of the tour. The tour was Rabbeinu Yaakov Bala Turim. This is, I mean, these are tremendous Rishonim. The Rosh is one of the three rabbis that Maran, the Bet Yosef, says that in any halakha, if I have two out of these three rabbis agreeing to something, I will say that that's the halakha. The Rif, the Rambam, and the Rosh, those three. So he's one of the three Amudei Hahora'a, one of the three great rabbis that if the Rosh ever says something, he's one of the three that the Bet Yosef votes from, and he says that's the halakha based on these three rabbis. Two out of the three say the same thing, he goes with that. So the father of the Rosh Rabbein Yechiel, he had a deal with somebody, a friend of his, that they would learn together, and he made he made him swear. They both swore that whoever dies first will come back to the other person in a dream and tell him what what the process of going to Shemaim after dying is all about. And the friend died first, and Rabbein Yechiel at the funeral got up and said, "We swore to each other that." One of us, whoever dies first, will tell the other what the procedure is after they go to Shemaim. And I'm here by announcing he has to fulfill his oath. It says before they put his body in the ground, they saw the coffin start to shake like that. They thought he was alive, right? They thought he was living. So they opened it up and they saw that he wasn't moving. Just his eyelids were opening and closing, opening and closing like that. So they realized that he he's telling them he, he doesn't have permission to reveal anything, and therefore he has to be absolved of his shivua. So that's the idea that you have over here, uh, no permission, no permission from the from the neshamot to come and to reveal these things to us. But we know, based on what we're learning now, that these things are happening during this time. So therefore the prayers for these neshamot are very, very special. Also he writes that it's important to give tzedakah, if possible, li'ilui, these neshamot as well. And when we do that, we do a big chesed for these neshamot that, the are, that are, that are, yes, yes, yes. We do a huge, huge chesed for them. 
and no question in return, they'll do the same thing. I'll just share with you one story. I think I, I shared this with you in the past about uh, Rabbi Ben Porat Shlita that told over the story. I, I think I may have shared it with you. If I did, let me know. But uh, if not, it's worthwhile. True story with somebody who is alive and well today, Baruch Hashem. Rabbi Ben Porat was here in the shul he, a, a, a couple of years back. We had a whole Shabbaton with him. Anyway, so he tells over the following story. He says that he had a cousin, very distant relative in France, that was from uh, his, his family. And this was in the 70s. He was living in uh, Ofakim, which is in the south of Israel. And he had a big family at the time. And he had like maybe two bedrooms for like 11 kids or something like that. Some kind of very big number, maybe, maybe uh, three bedrooms, I don't know. But he had a, a terrace that he wanted to close in and make it into another bedroom because he needed the space. What happened was he made this, um, he, he wanted to, he looked into it. He, he was told it's going to cost him $3,000 to make this into another room. Well, in the 70s, I guess it was worth a lot more. But for an avrech, for somebody who's sitting and learning the whole day, it's significant money. So... He, uh, he said, okay, there's no money. There's no money. What can you do? Right? So he, he, let, he let the whole thing go. And one day he gets a phone call uh, from his father. His father told him, listen, there's a guy, that he's a distant relative of mine. He called me. He said, he wants to talk to you. So I gave him your number. He's going to give you a call. I said, okay. The guy calls from France. He says, listen, I'm going to be in Israel in a couple of months. I want to meet you. Uh, I want to talk to you about something. I heard, you know, I know your father. He's my cousin and we haven't really spoken much, but I need to speak with you. I know that you're a rabbi and I want to talk to you. He says, okay. He says, where do you want to meet? He says, we're going to meet at the Kota. You know, he couldn't send it. He never saw the guy. He doesn't know what he's going to look like. There's no pictures. There's no email. There's no nothing. So he says, I'll look like this and I'll meet you at this spot at the Kota. And they, they figured out how to meet up. And surely enough, they meet up at the Kota. And the guy comes a couple of months later. He says, listen, he's not religious. His family is also not religious. They don't know anything. And he knows that when he dies, none of his children or grandchildren or anybody is going to be saying Kaddishman. Nobody. He says, I'm here in Israel. You're my relative. And I want, I want to give you a job. You say Kaddish for me after I die. He says, I don't want this to just be a, you know, a favor. I want to make sure you're going to do it. So this is your payment. And he takes out of, an, out of his pocket an envelope. Because. And he gives him an envelope full of money. Says, okay, fine. He goes back home. How much is there? $3,000. <laughs> right? Exactly what he needed. Hashem took care of him. Fine. So he's sitting... One day, a few months later, and he's sitting and he's in his living room, learning. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he sees in front of him, this cousin of his, he sees him right here. Like I'm sitting and I'm talking to you. I see the guy right here in front of me. That's what he says. He sees the guy. The cousin was dead. He sees the guy sitting right there. He, he was shocked. And all of a sudden, he doesn't see him anymore. Okay. That's the story. That's the story. He thought it was very odd. So he takes out the guy's number. And he calls France. And he says, can I speak to so-and-so? And they answer and they say no. And he says... Um, who, who am I speaking to? He says, uh, I'm so-and-so. I'm, uh, I'm his brother-in-law. Oh, you're his brother-in-law? Well, you remember me? I'm, you know, so-and-so. We're, we're family and this and that. We had a whole big, they had a whole big talk. And he says, of course I remember you. Yeah, I came to Israel, isn't that? He's like, so, okay, so you know me. So why can't I speak to so-and-so? Let me talk to him. Says, you can't speak to him because he's dead. He says, you're kidding me. <laughs> when did he die? Now he's wondering, he's worried. Maybe he died three, four months ago, and he hasn't, hasn't been saying Kaddish on him because he doesn't know 
You know, he didn't know that he died. He says he died last night. We didn't even bury him yet. Wow. Right? So he says, wow. So he explained, like we just learned, this is not something that's very simple. They don't get your shoot to come back and to show themselves to people. When these neshamot go on, they don't have permission to... St- but over here, he paid him. And he said, I paid you. Meaning, that's what he's basically saying. He's like, I gave you all. You owe me. Now your job begins. Tadish starts now. We never heard this. You never heard this story from me? Absolutely. Yeah, well, that's a true story from Rabbi Ben-Bar. I, I wasn't sure if I understood the story right. So I called him. I Actually, when he came, I asked him about the story. And he said, yeah. He actually told me even more details, which were even more amazing, and I forgot. But <laughs> I'll ask you again. But that is, but that is, it's an unbelievable thing. This is with somebody that was in our shul. He said, I saw the guy in front of me all of a sudden. Yeah. I don't know. This, wow. is a, this is a myth. This is true. So well, we have to think about these things because this is what this month, this Kodesh Nisan is all about. Kodesh Nisan is all about fixing ourselves, getting ready for Pesach. And we, should, we shouldn't just come into Pesach as is. We have to work on ourselves. We have to get rid of the ga'ava. We have to give more tzedakah. We have to make sure that we that we make ourselves pure and holy, so that when we have real, you know, Pesach, it's a real yitziat nifsaim for all of us. We're gonna stop over here, guys. Thank you for joining us. Uh, as, as, yes, I, I just want to say something. Yeah, the idea is to do as much as you can, brachot, tzedakah, chesed, as much as you can, and all, and exactly when you daven. And you say the Tfilah Le'iluin HaNeshamot, that's also very important. Okay, guys, because I keep moving. Thanks for joining us.